I'm Tony Campolo. I, I'm a professor of sociology at Eastern University, St. David's, Pennsylvania. And uh, basically, uh, somebody who's trying to figure out how to be a follower of Jesus in the modern world. Except that Martin Luther King was a drum major for justice uh, is a good statement. I think he, uh, he did two things. First, he, uh, he gave to poor people, and especially to the African-American community, a sense that they could change things. He rallied them and made them believe that they could triumph over evil, that the prejudices, the discrimination, the hatred that had haunted them and tortured them over the years uh, could be overcome. And not surprising that uh, We Shall Overcome became the song that he nurtured in his rallies and in his meetings. That was the first thing he did. The second thing he did was for the oppressing establishment basically the white establishment, and said, uh, I'm not only here to free up those people who have been oppressed, but the oppressors also need to be freed. They are enslaved by prejudices and attitudes that are detrimental to their humanity and are crippling their spirituality. So, that's what he saw himself as being. He saw himself as a conscience for oppressed oppressors, and he saw himself as a uh, giver of hope for the oppressed. Well, if you take the scriptures seriously, and I do, you'll find that at the end of the first chapter of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul writes to the church that he, he, Jesus, wants to bring all principalities, all powers, all dominions, all thrones into subjection to himself. And the next line is, through the church. So it's not uh, that Martin Luther King Jr. suddenly dreamed this up. It's a biblical imperative, namely that the church is called to uh, be at work in the world, uh, transforming social institutions, bringing them into conformity to what God wills for them to be. The Apostle Paul teaches specifically in the book of Ephesians and then again in the book of Colossians that all principalities and all powers, that is all social institutions, political, economic, educational, uh, recreational, all social institutions, labor unions, corporations, all principalities and powers were willed into existence by God, but they became rebellious, just as we as individuals have become rebellious. And uh, the task of the church is to call these principalities and powers, these institutions, uh, those in government, those in the economic system, into repentance for the evils of the past and making a commitment to use their vast social powers for good, for transforming the world from what it is into what God wants for it to become. Well, I teach at Eastern University, and I love this school because of many reasons, but the primary reason is its motto, and its motto is this, the whole gospel for the whole world. If all you're talking about is individualistic salvation, it's not the whole gospel. If all you're talking about is social justice, it's not the gospel. The whole gospel em embraces both of those things with equal intensity. Uh, 
a group of young people call themselves red letter Christians now. Primarily because we want to provide a corrective. The corrective is this. The we evangelicals have concentrated our reading and our studying on the teachings of the Apostle Paul. A Franciscan Catholic friend of mine said, you evangelicals get saved and then you go to Bible studies, but study after study is on the Paul's epistles. And I thought back and I thought to myself, he's right. In my teenage years, I was doing Bible studies. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians, even Romans. I don't ever remember going through an exhaustive Bible study on, on the Gospels. What happens is that we evangelicals get steeped in Pauline theology. And if we ever get around to reading the Gospels, we try to squeeze the teachings of Jesus to fit in with our Pauline theology. And note, it's our Pauline theology. What Paul taught and what we think he taught may be two different things. Vice versa, said my Franciscan friend. When we become Christians, we become steeped in the Gospels and eventually get around to reading the epistles. So that we squeeze Paul into the categories that Jesus has prescribed. Actually, we need both. We need sound doctrine. And nobody in scripture lays out the way of salvation with more clarity than the apostles Paul. Would we understand salvation through faith? We're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Where does that come from? Paul. We're, the just shall live by faith. Where does that come from? Paul. Would we know anything about justification if it wasn't for Paul? He spells out the meaning of the cross. He makes it clear what Jesus accomplished on Calvary's tree, that I will not be punished for my sins because Jesus on Calvary's cross took my sins upon himself. He makes that clear. He provides us with our theology. Jesus prescribes a lifestyle. We love the theology. We have rejected as evangelical Christians the lifestyle. Jesus said, love your enemies. I have a bumper sticker that reads, when Jesus said, love your enemies, he probably meant we shouldn't kill them. You say, are you suggesting that we should be nonviolent resistors? May I point out to any one of those who are watching this, Martin Luther King said, we should be nonviolent resistors. We should be, he would have called a pacifist. I think nonviolent resistors is a better term. We do want to resist evil, but not with violence, not with guns, not with war. You, you say, are you kidding? I'm not kidding. Uh, when Jesus said, love your enemies, I think he meant that you don't kill them. Uh, read through the Sermon on the Mount. Throw it out and say, I don't believe Jesus. But don't try to fit Jesus into your political uh, philosophy. Jesus says, blessed are the merciful. If you were to take a survey among evangelicals, you would find not only do they support war, which Martin Luther King would not, but compared to the general population, evangelicals are much more in favor of capital punishment. Even though Jesus said, blessed are the merciful. He did say that. Martin Luther King would say, that's what it's about. It's about being merciful. You say, but if somebody commits a capital crime, shouldn't there be capital punishment? Jesus would say, that's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. If he's taken a life, he should surrender his own life to the electric chair. It's no longer an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Is anybody going to argue that Jesus taught that? And so I say that we evangelicals have had a strong tendency to come up with a solid theology of justification by faith and that we're saved by grace. I think our Catholic brothers and sisters, especially those Franciscans, need to hear more about our theology. We need to hear more about their lifestyle. 
When I shared this discussion with my uh, Catholic Franciscan friend, I said, but how does this work out in real life? We who emphasize doctrine, you who emphasize lifestyle, you who emphasize giving away all your money to the poor, who make St. Francis of Assisi your model, you who, who take Jesus seriously, who says, if you want to be my disciple, sell what you have, give to the poor, take up the cross and follow me. What's the difference? I mean, how does this work out in real life? We who emphasize doctrine, Jesus who advocates his radical lifestyle. The answer is quite simple, he said. You guys turn out television evangelists, we turn out Mother Teresa. That's a frightening statement, but it's true. And those who criticize Mother Teresa say, she did a lot of good works, but she never really articulated justification by faith and that Jesus being the way of salvation and the only way to salvation. They emphasize works. We, understand, we emphasize doctrine. We need both the doctrines of Paul and the lifestyle prescribed by Jesus. I often ask this, how can you be rich and call yourself a follower of Jesus. You say, whoa, that's really dangerous. Indeed it is. But Jesus warns that it's harder for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. You cannot serve, said Jesus, God and mammon, God and money. You cannot serve them both. And yet, I find our churches are raising up a generation of young people to serve money to serve mammon. Here's something that I hear all the time. And if you put this in the film, it'll upset a lot of people. We say to our children, go to school and get a good education. And if the kids ask, why? We tell them, if you get a good education, you get a good job. And if you get a good job, you'll make a lot of money. And if you have a lot of money, you'll be able to buy a lot of stuff. And we're not serving mammon. I think that young people should go to university and get a good education. That's why I encourage all the young people I know to come to my university, because I love this school, Eastern University. But I tell the students here at Eastern, the purpose of an education is not what you were told. It's not to get the credentials, to get the job, to make the money, to buy the stuff, most of which you don't really need. The purpose of an education is to equip you so that you can serve Jesus Christ in a more effective manner, so that your service to Christ and his kingdom here on earth can reach an optimum level. Education is to equip you for the work of God in the world. It's not to enable you to get rich. There's nothing wrong with money. But my hero is John Wesley, who said, it is the task of every Christian to work as hard as he can, to make as much money as he can, to spend as little as he can in order that he might do all the good that he can. And when he died, he had a worn out Bible and a, in US money, approximately $17 in his pocket. That's all he owned. He had given it all to Christ in his kingdom. No wonder they call St. Francis of Assisi the last Christian. I don't think he's the last one. I think John Wesley is right up there with him. But I'm not sure that there are many Methodist churches in America that are calling upon its members to do what John Wesley said his followers should do. So, I think this duplicity of saying, we're going to be into sound doctrine, and another group saying, we're going to be into a sacrificial and radical lifestyle prescribed by Jesus. I contend that we need both the doctrines and the lifestyle. And as a matter of fact, I think James was right. When you say you have faith, I want to see your faith in your works. That doesn't mean that works will save you. 
But if you don't have works, as James writes, I really question whether you have the faith. If you study those schools, especially the colleges that were created, they were basically created by Christian abolitionists from the North. The people who lived in those states, this will offend some people, but check it out historically, didn't do much along those lines. It was missionaries, you said it well, coming down from the North, the abolitionists who in fact worked to abolish slavery came into the states who were formerly state, slave states during the Civil War and established these schools. And that's because the white Christians in those states were not about to meet the educational needs of black children. Now don't tell me that all you have to do is have people born again and society will be right. I hear that all the time. Don't worry about changing societal systems. Just win people to Jesus. And people, let me tell you, I spend most of my time out there trying to win people to Jesus Christ as Lord, Savior, and God. If you check my speaking schedule, you'll find I'm on doing evangelism 80% of the time. Do very little teaching in the university these days. I'm into that. Having said it, we have to begin to look at what people do collectively. And so you have all of these born-again Christians in Alabama, you just mentioned Alabama, who came into a personal salvation story with Jesus. But that did not undo the prejudices and the attitudes towards black people. Their Christianity made them somewhat benevolent. But there's a big difference between charity and justice. If these Christians in Alabama, and it was overwhelmingly a Christian state, had been really filled with the Holy Spirit and guided by the Spirit to do justice, to love mercy, to do justice and walk humbly with their neighbors, their neighbors being black people, we wouldn't have had to send missionaries from the north to start schools in the South. Those Christians there would have in fact taken the bull by the horns and immediately addressed the educational needs of children. They didn't do it. They were more influenced by the mores and the folkways of the culture than they were by the teachings of scripture and the leading, leading of the Holy Spirit. Now, if that upsets people, I'm an old guy. By the time people mobilize to bring me down, I'll be dead. So it doesn't bother me to say what I really know to be true and what they know to be true. It was because the people of Alabama, through their political instruments, did not take care of the educational needs of the children because they didn't believe that the church should be involved in government, that missionaries had to come down from the north and do what the people of Alabama should have done on a massive scale. What the missionaries did was commendable. Having said that, they only touched a minute segment of the black population of the state, and the masses were left behind. What do you think Martin Luther King would have said about all of that? Just get off your butt. <laughs> yeah. Uh, You know, a recent study was done on the members of Congress and members of the Supreme Court asking what were the major influences in molding your political philosophy. I was shocked to learn that some of the most prominent leaders in the Congress cited Ayn Rand as the most important influence in their lives in molding their political philosophies. 
To me, that's frightening. That's absolutely frightening. Ayn Rand, uh, author of The Fountainhead, uh, who wrote a book called The Virtue of Selfishness, who taught people, and there are persons all over this country who are followers of Ayn Rand, uh, who laud selfishness and egocentricity, just the opposite of what Jesus was all about. Uh, Ayn Rand says you gotta look out for number one and not worry about anybody else. That's not where Jesus would be. And as a follower of Jesus, that's not where Martin Luther King Jr. would be. Uh, unless a man uh, loses his life, he cannot gain it. That's what Jesus said. Unless a man dies, he cannot live. Uh, you want to be my follower, said Jesus. This is Jesus. Sell what you have, give to the poor, take up the cross and follow me. It was Jesus who said, harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. America is, I think, economically doomed unless something incredibly radical happens. Here's what's going on. The wealth of this country is being concentrated in the hands of a very few people, the upper 5% of the population. Case in point, 25 years ago, the typical CEO of a major uh, 500 club, uh, 500 company, was making 30 times more money than middle management. Today, that person is making 300 times more money. They end up with multi-million dollar bonuses for presiding over banks that are failing. Nobody's gonna argue with this, the facts are there. The corruption on Wall Street, in which billions of dollars are shifting into the hands of a few people. And you say, and that's gonna doom the nation? Of course it is. Two things. First of all, they get all kinds of tax deductions. All kinds of loopholes in the tax laws. So that a good example of this that nobody's going to argue with because he said it out loud is Mitt Romney, who is a good man, may I emphasize, a good man who did nothing illegal. He took all the deductions he was legally entitled to and ended up paying 15% on the millions and millions of dollars that are his assets. While the typical factory worker and secretary ends up paying somewhere around 35% of his or her income. You call that justice? Martin Luther King would have railed against that. He would have said, this is not the way it should be. Woe unto you, Americans, who end up serving the poor. There's a couple of passages in the 10th chapter of Isaiah that go like this, railing against those who are in government. Woe unto you who are the rulers of the land, who pass laws that oppress the poor and the widow and serve the interests of the rich. What will you say on the day of judgment? What will you say on the day of the Lord? As an evangelical, I, I believe the Bible. I believe it's infallible. The problem is that I think most of my evangelical friends are very selective in the passages that they read. They love to read those passages about sanctification and predestination and eternal security and, and, and that we're saved by grace. And I thank God we are saved by grace. But they don't want to read all the things that cause them discomfort. So this needs to be said, that uh, Jesus caused people discomfort. Martin Luther King caused people discomfort. I think it was uh, Reinhold Niebuhr said, the task of the church is to comfort the troubled and to trouble the comfortable. That's what Martin Luther King was about. Troubling those of us who have become comfortable with the injustices and the oppression that we as a people are bringing about in today's world. 
The reason why I said all of that about wealth being concentrated in the hands of the few is simply this. The thing that brought about the Great Depression in the 1930s was exactly that. And the middle class had less and less buying power until they reached that point where they didn't have enough money to buy the things that were being turned out by the American factories. When we lose the ability, when we middle class people lose the ability to buy what American produces, America will stop producing. And that's what brings on a depression. It's interesting to me that we live in a society where the very wealthy are paying such a small level of taxes. I love Ronald Reagan, but I have to remind my friends that Ronald Reagan raised taxes 11 times when he was president of the United States. I know Rush Limbaugh would not like that to be said, and he's not about to say it. But Ronald Reagan understood that you can't overtax the middle class and let the rich off the hook. I think Martin Luther King would say exactly the same thing. Here then is the reality. One of our leading evangelical leaders who's in politics today wants to get rid of the income tax and replace it with the sales tax. Let me show you just how evil that is and what Martin Luther King would say about that. We're gonna get rid of the income tax and we're gonna have a sales tax. You take a Bill Gates who makes millions of dollars daily. He spends only a small fraction of that on any given day. Even if he buys a mansion, even if he buys five cars to drive around, he's only spending a small proportion of his income, which means only a small proportion of his income is going to be taxed. But that factory worker that makes $55,000 a year, who has to pay his mortgage, has to pay his payments on his car, who has to buy food and gasoline, which is going sky high, spends what percentage of his income? Answer. 100%. So what you do when you shift from a income tax to a sales tax is simple. Middle class people end up paying 100% tax because they spend all their money on just staying abreast of things, especially when the income is going down every year. And nobody's going to argue that the income of the middle class in terms of buying power is declining every year. So you want to shift from an income tax to a sales tax? And this leading evangelical politician says, this is my plan for the future, and if I run for president, this is what I am going to advocate. Gee, do we do simple math? Do we think, are evangelicals stupid, or are they complicit with evil? It's one of the two. Because you can't deny the fact that if you shift from an income tax to a sales tax as a means of supporting the country, that the middle class and the lower classes are going to, in fact, be carrying 100% of the burden, 98% uh, of the burden, and the rich, which spend very little of their massive income, I mean, what do they do with their money? They invest it in offshore banks. You know it, I know it, all the people who are watching this watch. Uh, no. And you know what Martin Luther King would be saying today? Woe unto you. Woe unto you legislators who have been bought off. I, I really have a solution to America's political problems. I think, I think that congressmen should have to do what NASCAR drivers do. Wear the emblems of those who finance them all over their suits. So at least we knew who owned them. Because the truth is, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, running for office a day takes vast amounts of money. And those who finance those campaigns are controlling America to serve their interests. And they're not serving the
the interest of the ordinary citizen. I think this is the kind of thing that Martin Luther King would rile against, scream against, yell against. I wish he was around today. You say, can't you do it, Campolo? No, I can't. Why? Because God gave to Martin Luther King eloquence. He was able to put into words the concerns. I, I'm, a, I'm a sociologist. I, I, I've been talking like a sociologist. Martin Luther King knew how to go to the hearts of people, know how to touch their emotions. He did it with words, and nobody has come along who has been able to articulate the pain and the sufferings of the oppressed like he did. His letter from the Birmingham jail is one of the classic pieces of literature that I think every Mer American ought to, ought to read. They ought to make every high school kid read the letter from the Birmingham jail. When he says to the white ministers of, of Birmingham, you say that we shouldn't be expecting change to occur too quickly. Well, I want to tell you why I can't wait. And he starts talking about what prejudice and discrimination has done to his little girl, to his little boy. These are the things that, these are the things that disturb him. In a pluralistic society such as we live in, we have to seek what is becoming more and more called the common good. The common good. Not just good for Christians, but good for all people. If we are to achieve that, if we are to achieve a society that pro promotes the common good, then we're going to have to work together with people who are of different religious orientations than our own. The thing to be cautious about is that we don't water down our own faith. I'm an evangelical Christian. I am not about to water down those distinctives of my faith. The doctrines of the Apostles' Creed, which I think sum up what every Christian should believe. Most people can recite it. A high view of Scripture, recognizing that the Scriptures are our infallible guide for all our faith and all of our practices and that salvation comes through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I served on the interfaith gathering. I won't tell you what it is because it was a very prominent one. And uh, there were equally divided, Muslims, Jews, Christians. It was a political gathering, let me say that much. And the chairperson turned to me and said, well, what do you want from all of these people here? I said, on one level, let me tell you what I want. I want to win every person here, Jew, Muslim, and those Christians who aren't committed to Christ. I want to win you all to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. What do you think the reaction of the group was? The Muslim guy stood up and said, that's exactly what I want. I want to win all of you people to Islam. We all laughed. They understand what we're about. We don't have to pretend that we're something other than we are. But at the core of Christianity is the concept of compassion. At the core of true Islam, not Al-Qaeda, but true Islam, is the concept of compassion. At the core of Judaism, there is compassion. These three great religions all advocate compassion. We're going to disagree on the basis of salvation. Being an evangelical Christian, I can't help but quote Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's where I am. But having said that, I'm committed to compassion. If true Muslims are com committed to compassion, if true Jews are com committed to compassion, can we not agree, not on the way to salvation, but to live out compassion in the world? That's what we mean by the common good. How do we live out the compassion that our respective religions hold to? Let me quote some scripture to you. They came to Jesus once 
And they said, there is someone, more than someone, there are several in another city who are doing the same work you're doing, who are healing people, who are calling them to live compassionately. But they're not doing it in your name. And Jesus' response is what? If they're not against us, they're for us. Simple language, Jesus acknowledged that there was a thing called the common good. And insofar as they're doing compassionate works, they are not our enemies. If they're not, if they're, if they're for the same things we're for, you know, if they're not against us, they're for us on this thing, on compassionate works. I think that we Christians had better grow up. We now know that the majority of Americans are no longer Protestants. And within the Protestant community, I would have to say about only about 40% would call themselves evangelical born again Christians. We're a minority. Unless we work with other people, it's not gonna work. Benjamin Franklin, hardly a member of the God Squad, once said at the signing of the, of the uh, Declaration of Independence, we must all hang together or surely they will all hang us separately. Whoa. We need unity in America. And Christians, as I said earlier, are called to a ministry of reconciliation, not to a ministry of polarization. Uh, there are things that, uh, that uh, we believe that we have to affirm. I have a very good friend who, if I mentioned his name, um, everybody would know his name. He's a very, very prominent rabbi. He said to me in a personal conversation, if you had to describe the Jewish people in one sentence, how would you describe us? I said, I'd probably say you're God's chosen people. He said, you're right. Have you ever heard a Jew say that publicly? When we're together in the synagogue, we remind each other we are God's chosen people. But when we're out in the marketplace, when we're in the schools, we're in the political arena, we don't look down on other people and say, you're not as good as we are. We are God's chosen people. You won't hear us say that. That's a good attitude to say, yeah, when I'm with my fellow Christians, I, I have to affirm that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life, and that those who are not in Christ are lost. However, in the general world, I want to affirm that my Jesus teaches compassion and the Quran teaches compassion and the Hebrew Tanaka teaches compassion. We can agree on that. And as we work together for the common good, I want to use this relationship that I've established with those who have different religions. I want to use this as an opportunity to share my faith with them, even as they endeavor to share their faith with me. I would love for us to be a people who are so committed to the common good that we're working together and in working together are listening to each other's deepest personal faith with the idea of convincing each other